about five minutes if you want to do anything. <laughs> have some, would you like some coffee or any uh, fruits yeah, or anything? I got to tell you that. From that. I'm going to log in and see. Let <laughs> me check the slides. Can you see from here clearly? <laughs> Can you change? I know it, it was a mistake on the email. Is it possible to change it or is it too late? Go to C2C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay, you can change okay. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? This. Oh, okay. No okay. Oh, that email, the title and the line. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Gao, can you just speak into the mic? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, no, no. It's lagging. Wait, like, uh, sorry. Wait for your words. Yeah, it's like, uh, like. Professor Gat, can you just speak into the mic? Hello, can you hear me? It's, 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 using, this, it's using the computer mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's here, it's here. Yeah, it needs to use that mic. Uh, that one will be called to this one. So why are we using, we need to use that one. Uh, it, it's not, it's not working like that. But this one can work well. Uh, so why is he wearing the mic? He doesn't need the mic. Though. Not the, the mic with the uh, recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I see. Okay. We need to we need to fix this for next time. We'll we'll figure out how to do okay. it. Is okay? It's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. We're good. Okay, good because uh, you know, this one is blinking. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. When when you speak, it will blink. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Over. Hey, uh, you know Joe. Hey, Joe. How are you? Yeah. Hey, Joe. Two more minutes. Yeah. Uh, do you use a round after it or something? I'm on my mark. Maybe you can sit down with a round hour. Yeah, yeah. The kick is six. Yeah. Yeah, you're on that. Yeah, you're on that. Professor Oliver Gal from uh, Cornell University. Uh, Oliver is the director of CTEC, the University Transportation Center at Cornell, similar to C2Smart. Um, he's doing a lot of interesting work, so we're happy to have Oliver. And, uh. Thank you, Sri. Uh, 
thank you for coming. I know, like you know, this is a like a afternoon hour, probably right after lunch. So let me uh, let me see if I can kind of uh, counter like the after lunch sleepiness so that get you away. <laughs> so uh, I do uh, I do have quite a few slides. So I will go sometimes slow and sometimes faster. But I do want to convey a very complete story to you so that you will see actual transportation. It's not only about cars or people or roads. Actually, it has to do with every aspect of our life. So um, I want to emphasize to kind of, you know, I'm serving as a director of this other UTC, which is we call uh, the Center for Transportation, Environment, and Community Health. But in the meantime, at Cornell, I have been also serving as a director of Cornell System Engineer. And I find actually these two things kind of they are linked so nicely. So I think if there's anything I would like you to take home today, it's really system thinking. System thinking about a lot of challenges uh, that we human beings are, we are facing today. So uh, I would like to start my uh, talk by uh, kind of throwing you uh, a question. Do you really believe that we human beings, we are facing a real sustainability challenge? Do you really believe in that? Of course, you can see this word sustainability has been talked for decades, right? We have been used to that, however, have you really thought about is that does that kind of really strike you know, anything when you, uh, to you when you when people talk about this word? So I just want to ask one question. Can you imagine just today we're living here and you know, we have these kind of you know stacks here. So every day, on a typical day, the natural resource that each one of us consume every day, if they use all this natural resource to support a person back in the agriculture age. Can you imagine how many days that person can survive using our daily consumption? Anyone? Give it a guess. Let's give it a try. Uh, 20 days. 20 days. Any other, any other um, kind of guess? So I'll give you the answer. It's got 300 days. So the natural resources, just imagine, even the shirts where, you know, where, where, can you imagine where it comes from? And uh, like kind of, even if an apple you are eating, can you imagine where that apple comes from? Compared to in the agricultural age, a person goes out in their garden, picks up an apple, right? So, so what I'm trying to kind of today, every day, the daily consumption from natural resources that we are using one day can support a person back in uh, agriculture 300 days. So you can see that we are all engineering students. Imagine that if we assume, I think this is a very reasonable assumption. If we assume that the capacity of all the natural resources on this earth. If we assume that there is a capacity, now we're spending it 300 times faster than what people did, you know, all these years back. So it's really this kind of speed that really constitutes this kind of, uh, you know, challenge. Of course, imagine like, imagine that if we are, even that doesn't strike anything on our mind. Imagine that if we are, if you were the second to the last generation on this earth, and if you see your child. Hang on, they're asking for help, but you realize that, okay, since I'm the second of the last generation, it's too late. So I'm trying to use this 300 times faster. Imagine if you were the last, the second to the last generation. And then do you believe our sustainability challenge? So continually, uh, I would like to kind of, you know, um, extend my uh, talk with two questions. The first question, I have, it has to do with each one of us. What is your most valuable asset? Of course, grad student, you're going to be working hard to get your degree. After you get your degree, what do you do? You're going to get a job. After you get a job, what do you do? You're going to try to make some money. That will be a part of your asset. After you get some money, you're going to buy a car. And then further down the road, you're going to buy a house with a car. But we all know that as a person, if you don't have this, all the other parts means nothing to you. So you can see that as an individual, the most important asset is actually our health. And speaking of health, look at, you know, uh, as a nationwide, this country, we spend more than 17% of our national GDP on health care. What is health care? Health care is only taking care of people after people get sick. But how often do we ask ourselves, how did people get sick? How can we take preventive measures to prevent people from getting sick? Right, so you can see that this is one thing. And now my second question was, what is a nation's, what is a country's most valuable asset? Obamacare. Obamacare, <laughs> but, it, that's, but is that an asset, I mean, in terms of national asset? So of course, very naturally, you would think of 
natural resources, mm -hmm. oil, water, all you know, the land. This is very important national asset. Of course, you know, this is very close to all of infrastructure, right? We invest so much, we build all this infrastructure, which is a very important part of our national asset. Of course, right? There is people. So speaking of here, of course, you know, I'm going to talk more about this infrastructure asset. Speaking of infrastructure, look at. You know, the, all these different countries, how they spend their, uh, you know, infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, investments. Of course, you can see that here, United States only kind of probably invest about 2.3 percent of national GDP. Remember that for the healthcare, that's 17 percent. So this is 2.3 percent. Even this 2.3 percent, you can see that translated into uh, a, a real is kind of now we're talking about two trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Of course. Now, even the government is talking about that. They don't know who is going to pay for these $2 trillion. But the government, at the most, can pay $500 billion. Right? So anyway, so what I'm trying to say is actually what my own research uh, in, in the past, kind of, I think, two or three days, on my whole research career, and of course now the CTEC, the center, we are trying to answer a question that the linkage between our individual assets, health and infrastructure. How are these two related? Because you see that here, at this level, we have a lot of individual decisions to make. At this level, there are a lot of state, city level, and also as well as national level decisions and policies to make. But very seldom, how can we link these two together? Because we need a lot of decision here will affect this decision. A lot of decision here, in turn, will affect this. So speaking of health, can you imagine what affects our health? Of course, genetics. Right, you know, we inherit the genes, and that actually determines a lot of our health. But can you change it? You wish you could, but of course now people are talking about CRISPR, but still that's too expensive, too, you know, too dangerous, right? I think. Of course, another thing, the, the second factor is phenol. Again, right, that comes with it's very hard for us to change. However, there is one key, the third element actually we can do a lot, which is kind of uh, there is this word exposure. How many of you have heard of this word? Probably you have not heard of this. But this is a word from the you know the health community. Uh, Ten years ago, they started using this. You can see that these are the three elements that affect our health, right? So speaking of exposure, of course, this is where you live, right? After you go in any city you go, this will be a typical picture you see. What do we call this? This is we call New York City. Now you can see what defines a city. We build these cities for what? We build these cities for people. But when you see this picture that defines the city, but do you see people in this picture? You don't see people. What do you see? Ports, bridges, and buildings. All together we call infrastructure or build environment. So here, let me throw another question. Let's see how imaginative you are. Can you imagine if we put all the human bodies here in your city together, can you imagine what percentage of that human body will account for the whole city size? What percentage would that be? Can you give it a guess? Actually, the human bodies that this city is built to support for is only accounting for less than 0.01% of all this city size. If this doesn't shock you, imagine, of course, now you know we're taking so many things so, uh, for granted. Imagine this morning we'll come to work. You see someone, uh, one person driving an SUV. A person weighs around or less than 200 pounds. Do you know how much an SUV weighs? Four th more than 4,000 pounds. A 4,000 pound metal transporting a 200 pound person to work. Does that make sense? Right? So <laughs> with this, now imagine like you, you, you land and you check into a you know Manhattan hotel. Now you look out the hotel room window. Now you see people. And you bet, since you are New Yorkers here, you bet everyone here you see, everyone is smart. But when you are walking or taking a taxi, you're always calculating. Do you know what you are calculating for? You're calculating what is my shortest path to my meeting, to my class, right? So, and of course, we have a lot of bankers right on Wall Street. And also, like, we, we are doing the calculation, we feel we are smart, and we feel we are successful, and you feel that you are in control of your life. But did you ever realize what percentage of your life is really in your own hand? 
less than 10%. Actually, because all the things you did not realize that your life is actually shaped by something else. Can you imagine what these kids are doing here? You were once kids, right? Can, can you imagine what, what you were doing? Gambling. Huh? <laughs> Gambling? <laughs> that's, that's a very good thought. That's good. What, what else? So after these kids, you know, they were actually, they are playing with the rocks. Right, you can see that from there. What they, are, they, are, they are trying to play, they are trying to place the rocks on the path of ants. Now can you imagine when the kids put the rock on the path of ants, what do the ants do? What do the ants do? The ants will change their behavior, will find a new path, will adjust their behavior to adapt to the rocks that the kids right, put, you know, place around there. So what I call this slide is they are building the urban infrastructure for ants. Now, let's go back and now look at this picture again. And also, uh, oh, so actually, um, let's go back. So you can see that, you know, these kids, now can you have in this in mind, right, they're building urban center for ants. Now, if you go back to these slides, now what do you see in this picture? Rocks, ants. The thing is that you can see, because you can see that our lifestyle, the way that we live, it's so much shaped by the built environment, by the infrastructure, by the transponder system that has been built. But so kind of my point is that our life, our health, a lot is shaped by the infrastructures such as transportation. So how how has our built environment, how has our infrastructure been shaping and affect our health? Like let's look at some. Right? So how do you get to the work in the morning? Of course, even think about our kids, like we send them off to school and they take, you know, these kind of school buses or you drive. But when we're driving, kind of the one key thing we think about is actually safety, right? Because, you know, transponder safety affects our health. You just look at this shocking number of the financial cost. So that's why we're working so hard that we want to improve the safety. We want to reduce traffic accidents. Now, assuming that if we take care of all these car accident problems, uh, and then if they're safe, right, even like for this, this is every picture I took on the, drive, on the back of the driver's seat in Ithaca, uh, you know, the bus driver, you can see that. Do not cross the street in front of the bus because the bus could hit you, right? But did you ever know this? Do you believe in this? Do you believe in lessons? Actually, they're having so many studies actually showing that actually more people are killed by, by vehicle emissions than by car accidents. Hard to believe, but it's true, right? It's kind of car accidents kill people in a very kind of bloody way, but emissions kill people without you even noticing. However, you can see car accidents, it's kind of you, you hit one person, right? However, emissions, air pollution, they cover the whole area. Everybody, that hurts. So, so now, if you say, okay, if, for sure, if we take care of transport safety, if we take care of pollution, are we going to be okay? So, safe and clean, are we going to be okay? Now, if you look at this picture, this through the use obesity rate. 1996, 2016, 20 years, what did you see? So that can actually that also has to do with our transportation, right? We are just imagine our kids, you know. Of course, this country we call the you know the nation on a wheel, right? Huh? So because of this kind of motorized transportation, like we give up our opportunities to exercise while we are moving. So anyway, to summarize, you can see that we are enjoying a very advanced transportation system, the mobility system, but at a very high cost, at a very very high cost, right? This kind of you know disability adjusted. Uh, kind of health cost and also kind of air pollution related health cost. This is not only in the US, this is not only in China, this is everywhere. everywhere. Actually, you probably noticed that in recent day, uh, in recent years, actually air pollution is now coming back in European countries, Paris, London, right? So all these issues, what is wrong? Sorry, I can't use such a you know, kind of a great picture for you, but you know, unfortunately that's the reality. But what is wrong? What is the problem? Because you know, you are, uh, the future, and uh, you, you know, I, I believe, like NYU is educating you 
to be forward looking, to be the future leaders, right? So we need to think about what is wrong and what is the problem. We need to think deep. So what is wrong? And you know, I thought this for decades. Now I think my conclusion first I feel our paradigm, our philosophical paradigm for city development is wrong because and even not for not only for city but for everything we do, because we have always been pursued of efficiency. But we seldom pay attention to sustainability. Look at this. Can you see what this means? What is this basically essentially shows the evolution of our human transportation. What did we achieve from here to there? What did we achieve? Efficiency. Physical efficiency. Faster, faster, faster. So you can see that this if physical efficiency is one of the key criteria we use in our decision making. We human beings are smart. That's why you know, we are becoming faster. And also human beings are greedy. We want to become faster with less money. Another decision rule is economic efficiency. Physical efficiency, economic efficiency. Now you can see this is actually either at the national level or at the individual level decisions are made. Very seldom you can think about, oh, emissions come out, people are walking you know, on the street. You can see this seldom came into this equation. If this is not in the equation, how can you imagine that you will end up with cities that will prioritize the protection of your health? That's why today we are living in cities like this. Because this was not even in the equation. Right? You can see that this is a paradigm. That's a problem. And also, while we as educa education systems, actually we education system, we are also having problems. Because look at NYU, look at Cornell, right? We have all the, we, we take pride in all this kind of higher education system. However, you can see that our urban system, just imagine our urban system like in your engineer or civil engineer or kind of uh, C2 smart, we're producing you know, all these future engineers. And I believe you took a lot of optimization courses, right? And when you're doing op your optimization, what were you trying to optimize for? You are trying to optimize to reduce the total travel time. What does that mean? Physical efficiency, right? So our civil engineers, where you know you are very well trained to do your job well. However, anyone in this room, anyone coming from environmental background, anyone student, see zero, right? So, but you can see that we build all these infrastructure system, but they they have emissions into the air. How much do you know, civil you know, how, uh, how much do you know about this part? We know very little. However, we have environmental scientists. They buy very expensive equipment, millions of equipment, and they can measure how bad the air is. They're crying out, our air, our air environment is very bad. But do you think they can solve the problem up in the air? No, because the root of the problem is here in our hands while they identify this problem. Of course, not to mention Public health. Do we have any health person in this room? Zero. Right? You can see that we have all this. The reason why, because our education system is set up in a way, in a disciplinary way. Civil engineering students, you take this curriculum. Environmental science students, you take this curriculum. Health students, you take this curriculum. But they seldom cross. However, the two challenge that I mentioned, because it's really the challenge we're facing is a system challenge while the approach. We're, educa we're educating our future generations while taking a disciplinary approach. So we can see that that's why, of course, and then similar to when you graduate, you end up, for example, transporter consulting or DOT. So you are educated in a silo, and you are going to work in a silo. And environmental people are educated in a silo and are working in a silo. So that's kind of one of the key challenges that we need to overcome. So now you probably realize, oh yeah, we have these problems. So are we aware that we are wrong? Yes. I think you can see that it's actually not too difficult for me to convince you that there seems to be something wrong in our society, right? It's very easy to realize we are wrong, but we all know like human being nature. Let me show you another thing. Human beings individually, we grew from two year old to 20 year old, 40 and 60 years old. As we grow up, what happens? First, we become smarter. And next, what happens? 
we become wiser, right? However, if you look at human beings collective decision making, you will be shocked that so many times collective decision making of human beings are always like a two year old. So, what do I mean by two year old? So uh, I don't know how many of you have kids, or at least you were once a kid. Like imagine a two year old. If you bring a two year old the first time into a candy store, and you give her this candy, and after she finishes this first candy, even though it was for her first time, do you know what's going to happen next? When she finishes her first candy, what is she going to do oh, in the candy one. store? Another she'll one. ask for another one. She'll ask for another one. But imagine if you're a parent, you say, oh, actually, Katie, you know, this candy, you know, it tastes good, but it's, it's not very good for her health. It's not good for her teeth. So no, now let's just have one. Let's go. Let's get out of this candy store. And also, it was even you know, imagine in the candy store, you say, okay, actually, you know, candy is not good, but you know that, you know, this one is very good for you. <laughs> you know, eat broccoli, not candy. In a candy store, do you think you're going to be successful? No, right? So, speaking of this candy, speaking of this candy, 800 years ago, we, we, we discovered a candy. The candy was coal. The coal actually, even this is was 800 years ago, this was our human beings' first hand air pollution law. That was 800 years ago. Can you see this law by King Edward I? Was that very serious? Very serious, right? If you use this candy, you could lose your head. But are we still having this candy today? Yes. Yeah, right? So now, this today actually, in addition to coal, actually we have these cars, like another candy. So anyway, kind of, here. so I think my talk today is really, as I said earlier, this is really about system thinking. I would like you to help me, or together with me, think about, are we doing the right thing and doing it right? So starting from this point, I will kind of probably talk about something kind of a little bit technical, but I think you will appreciate how these things are so closely interrelated. So, you know, this, I don't know if we can, so you know, this actually, this was a video we showed the um, actually, uh, students, um, Merit Air Quality on uh, Ithaca campus. Of course, and imagine you know, Ithaca has very good air quality, but even in uh, Ithaca campus, behind some kind of uh, diesel buses, actually, we measure very high kind of air pollution. So this is basically after this, what this video was going to be about, but I will just uh, skip this. And some inclining truths, right? So sorry, this is New York City. Right, it's um, a kind of you know, air pollution. Even rich babies in the womb are learning development. If a person boy uh, was born in uh, Los Angeles, grew up there, she will have a double chance of developing cancer later in her life. Right. So, and then of course you have these all these different in you know, the kind of air pollution everywhere in the world. Right. So, what is the trend? So this shows up shows that vehicle miles traveled by passenger travel. This shows vehicle miles traveled by freight transportation. And uh, if I tell you one truth, is actually from the 19, uh, 1970s to now, actually, the cars we are driving nowadays, the cars we are driving are 95% cleaner than cars people drove back in the 1970s. What does that mean? Just let's just kind of, and then we, let, let's, see, let's, you know, let's assume all the other things keep the same. If the cars are becoming 95% cleaner, what would you expect for the air quality? Supposedly, you would expect clean air quality, but unfortunately not, because why? Look at this trend, this kind of vehicle miles traveled, this increase essentially canceled all the technological advancement. This is kind of one tricky thing, look at human nature. Whenever we human, whenever we come across difficulty or challenges, we think we're smart. We can design technologies. We rely so much on innovating technologies, but we did very little in managing our own demand. This is basically the demand side. Actually, for the freight transportation, the freight increase is even faster. How many of you have read that famous book you know, by Tom Friedman, The World is Flat? Why the world is coming, becoming flat? What is behind the flattening world? International trade. What is behind international trade? international logistics, transportation, right? So, you know, so this is, you know, the trend is not promising here. This is in the US. Of course, if you imagine, like, look at some, look at China and India. 
So here we have about uh, like kind of a uh, right, about 0 0.3, 0 0.3 billion population, and China about 1.4 billion, uh, you know, population. In these countries, right? So you can see that of course economy has been developing very fast. When the economy develops, when people become rich, what do people want to do? First, of course, you know, kind of they would like to probably buy an apartment, right? And naturally, you can see that after they buy the apartment, they would like to buy a car. So I know like nowadays there is another word that is very, very hot in research, resilience. You've heard about this word, resilience. Can you imagine, actually, we are trying to make our infrastructure resilient, but can you imagine what is the most resilient thing in this whole world? Can you imagine what is the most resilient thing in the whole world? A dream. If you plant, if you plant the seed of a beautiful dream in a person, especially if you plant the seed in the uh, in the person, in a very kind of outstanding person, and he or she will keep working towards their dreams. Now, these are the dreams of 1.4, 2.3 billion people, even more, right? So, um, and then how are transponder related to all these kind of air pollution and air quality, just kind of one keyword, transportation plays such a significant role in contributing to the urban air pollution. Right, so and then this is um, in the South Bronx. Actually, this was a study by NYU. Uh, NYU study showed that the school age children in South Bronx, the asthma rate is 23%. Do you know what this 23% means? This 23% is three times higher than the national average. Do you know why? We have this Hunts Point, which is the world's largest food distribution center. Every morning before 7 a.m. in South Bronx area, there are more than 13,000 diesel trucks idling while being refrigerated on diesel. Of course, we all know who are living in that South Bronx area, a lot of lower income people. And what is this food distribution center supplying for? A lot of rich people on my head island working. Right, so environmental justice problems. Um, now in terms of this diesel, I just mentioned this all this diesel, because this shows our technological advancement. So this was back in 1998, our you know, kind of standard for a new diesel engine or a new diesel truck, for example. This is not emission, this is PM emission. These are two key pollutants that are threatening our public health. And then 1998, 1990, 91, 94, 90, 98, 2002. This is post 2011. Are you amazed how smart people are? We reduce emissions of new engines or, or new trucks from this level all the way to this level. Isn't that beautiful, right? However, even give, give even with such kind of advancement, anyone you. Know, we know, you know that we use diesel engine a lot in a lot of heavy duty industry, including bus transit, trucks, and also construction equipment. Do you know why we use diesel engines for these heavy duty operations? The advantage of diesel engines that they are actually there, they use diesel, they are actually a little bit more fuel efficient than gasoline engine. And also diesel engines, they are much more durable than gasoline cars. So for example, a car probably use 10 years Right, you give up. But a truck can remain in the fleet for up to 30 years. And a truck, a diesel engine, a truck can run up to like 1 million miles. So as a result, even though for new model we have this kind of technology, but the key thing, what is running now on the road is still here. So you can see the one key problem we are trying to do is how do we clean up our existing diesel fleet? That comes in a kind of for the whole uh, nation, we need about $55 billion to clean that up. First, who is going to pay for that? Second, from a research point of view, what, uh, how are we going to be optimized? Actually, this is kind of very simple, kind of in mixed integer programming. That actually, the purpose is that well, <coughs> we want to minimize the cost, for example, of cleaning up our diesel fleet, but given some constraint, like we want to reduce emissions by 30 percentage, of course, the budget constraints, of course, continuity constraints, because you are still using your trucks or your buses here. You cannot take too many buses out of the fleet. So anyway, you know, this is a very simple exercise to optimize 
you know, our environmental abatement decision making. So like now we use that model to imagine now there are these different technologies. Each of them have different emission reduction efficiency and also, of course, cost. And we try to optimize and we apply this model to actually to the New York City Department of Education school bus fleet. Basically the model, applying the model that will tell a program manager, okay, for all your buses, what technology to apply to what buses to achieve your emission reduction goal while in the meantime minimize your cost. Of course, researchers, we can always make this you know, more complicated. For example, we can combine the problem of, of retrofitting with the routing decision of a bus. That kind of, you can use the retrofitted buses, which is cleaner, uh, a more populated bus route that will help reduce exposure, right? Of course, you can also take into account, you know, the maintenance cost, which is uncertain. Anyway, this is kind of all this kind of research exercise. But so far, you can see that we have developed models to optimize, to get the best bang per buck in our environmental mitigation, right? So now, my question, are we doing the right thing? We feel good, like, you know, I developed those models, I developed the codes to help the CD Department of Education to do that. If you use our model, yes, you can achieve the best time of art. However, it's cost-effective but unfair. You know, I, you know, this is a slide, actually, this has, this has three papers, but just, you know, very quickly, I want to talk about this environmental justice. If in environmental abatement, if we just purely pursue economic efficient, you know, cost-effectiveness, actually, we actually lead to the problem of environmental justice problem. Actually, we look at the New York State school bus clean up program and uh, we identified critical environmental justice problems. Essentially, richer st school district tend to get more money in retrofitting their buses if we use this kind of solely cost effectiveness criteria. You know, this is just, you know, if you're interested, I can send you the paper, but for the time, same, same time, I'll just move on. So now, if we say, if we can design a problem that is cost effective as well as fair, are we doing the right thing? So again, we're trying to reduce emissions. We're trying to reduce emissions in the fair way. Are we doing the right thing? So now I'll give you another, actually this has to do with air pollution. You know, by the way, I, I did my undergrad um, education, uh, I get a major in civil engineering and I got a um, dual degree in environmental science. So kind of, and then when I was doing my PhD, my PhD advisor, uh, she was a transportation professor but I had two other committee members on my PhD committee, which people call the Caltech Mafia of air quality modeling. So I have been always kind of exposed to this both uh, disciplines. So this is kind of air quality side, ozone pollution. Like New York City is eight hour ozone non-attainment area. So ozone stand is kind of is hurting public health here in this one. So this is the ozone formation in the atmosphere. Don't worry about to this part, just up here, you can see that ozone is not directly emitted in the air. Ozone is actually formed in the atmosphere by volatile organic compounds and the nitrogen oxides with solar radiation. Actually, this it has been this actually in the uh, kind of dynamic sense. And the transportation is a single major source in urban areas for both VOC and NOx. So now, if I tell you, okay, New York City is having ozone problem, and the transportation is a key source for these two precursor emissions. For any of you, if you are going to provide a recommendation to the decision maker, what would you say to them? to reduce all the pollution. I think a, pro, a very natural decision would be, let's control transponder emissions, right? That would be very natural way. But now, let's look at this. This was a study done, I can, there, this, these are the measurements of ozone pollution. Uh, you can see that this graph shows the daily cycle of ozone pollution, you can see, because of solar radiation, right? In the evening, ozone is pretty low. And around in the noon and 2 p.m., 3 p.m., ozone gets to the hot top and then it goes down. Right, it has to do with solar radiation. And what we did is actually we look at the data. These two graphs, the left shows ozone concentration by days a week, and this shows NOx. You may remember the NOx is a precursor of ozone, also by days a week. So, um, in actually this one, when I print it out, it's very clear. But now show here, it's it's not clear. But I will let you uh, tell you. You can see that this sunny. Can you see what this sunny curve? Which one is the sunny curve? It's actually the sun curve is the top, so which means the ozone concentration is the highest on Sunday, and then the second highest is actually Saturday, and then other weekdays. So this is for ozone. Now here, if you look at on this side, actually, nuts. This is a Sunday curve. 
And the second law is, is sided curve. You are all researchers, right? Now, does this graph kind of make you frowning a little bit? What happened? So, to simply speaking, actually, this what we call the ozone weekend effect. That has been observed in a lot of metropolitan areas in Europe, here in the US, in LA, in the New York City, Baltimore, Washington DC area. You can see that if we know that from weekday to weekend, the traffic goes down. Of course, the emission goes down. However, the ozone concentration goes up. So is this somehow like a kind of a virtual experiment of our previous policy? That we want to reduce transport emissions so that we can reduce ozone concentration. Now, over the weekend, traffic goes down, emission goes down, but ozone goes up. What, the, what is the problem? So actually, I'm using this. I can kind of, you know, kind of let you know that, of course, and we, we, we try to look into why is ozone concentration higher? Actually, we take the first derivative of those ozone curves. This basically shows how fast ozone is formed or destructed in the day. Of course, you can see the reason why Sunday ozone is higher because you can see Sunday, the, on Sunday, the ozone formation is faster. You know, when the rate is greater than zero, which is the formation stage. So now our question becomes, why is, is ozone accumulation faster on Sunday? And we move on to that. So actually, this is very quick. This kind of, you know, this environmental science, this shows like a contour plot. But it's basically showing that actually, if in the experiment in the lab, if you put VOC, different concerns, VOC and different concerns NUX into a, you know, into a, uh, into a lab, and then you try to measure the formation. Actually, this is how ozone is going to form from the contour plot. You know, this ridge above this ridge we call the VOC limited air quality. If you now if look, if you follow this green arrow with me, as we go down this green arrow, what happens to NUX, uh, to VOC? VOC concentration moves down. What happens to NUX? NUX concentration also goes down, but what happens to ozone? Ozone concentration <coughs> goes up. So in the VOC limited areas, a relative drop of NUX with respect to VOC will stimulate ozone formation. Right? Now if I tell you that actually heavy duty trucks, diesel trucks, are a major contributor to NUX. And cars are a major contributor to VOCs. With this information and this information, can you conceive some kind of hypothesis to explain the ozone weekend effect? After what we call a one key hypothesis, the NUX reduction hypothesis. We hypothesize that over the weekend, because heavy duty trucks reduce relatively more than light duty vehicle. As a result, right, kind of, you know, not reduce more. Of course, what's the next step? We have this hypothesis. What do we want to do next? We need to test this hypothesis. So we went back, actually, the same area in the Southern California area, we collect also this weighing motion data, which gives us truck versus car counts. Of course, we use this kind of, you know, non parametric factorial model to make sure that our analysis of the data is robust. And this is basically the result. You can see that this shows the days a week. This is shows the relative day effect. You know, I'm kind of uh, speeding up a little bit so that I can get you out uh, in time. You can see that this curve shows the relative drop of trucks from weekdays to weekend. Look at how much it dropped. While this one shows in the urban area, the lighter vehicles, cars. Cars drop a little, but not as much. So as a result, you can see that the VOC to NUX ratio from transportation goes up, and this shows all these confidence interval. Right? You can see now we see that we verify that you can see this transportation activity pattern due to the key point I'm trying to make. What I'm, the key point I'm trying to show you here is that atmospheric system is nonlinear system. It has complicated photochemical reactions. So when we make our policies, we have to take into account what is going to happen in the atmosphere. That's why I'm advocating that we need to integrate transportation and air quality models together. So because this is so now, so this is an air quality model. And now with that way, that takes into account all this non-linearity. So now, imagine, yes, we can have cost, we can have design cost-effective, fair, and even considering non-linearity of atmosphere, we can have with this, come up with these policies. Are we, are we, doing all the things right. So another more complicated thing is actually PM, particulate matter. 
right? This can show the different size of particle matter. What I'm trying to say is that from China, you can see it's really the actual fine part of smaller particles. What is our lung doing? What is our breathing system doing? We get air in. What are we looking for? We are looking for the oxygen. How does oxygen get into our body? If oxygen molecule can get into our body, and such kind of atom particles can also get in our body. And when these atom particles, when they get into the, our blood, where do they go? They can go anywhere. There was a very uh, striking study done in Mexico City. They followed a girl after she was born until she was seven years old. Actually, they, because from Mexico City is very polluted, they saw the, you know, the brain scan the condensation of aquam particles in the girl's brain. So the title of that news article was, air pollution not only affect your health, but also affect your mind. So uh, anyway, in transportation, again, you know, a big source of this. So now, after what I'm trying to say, after, it's really the smaller particles that affect our health, right? So, but smaller particles are not necessarily captured by this kind of mass space, after, because Particle mass concentration captures larger particles, but not necessarily smaller particles. Actually, this was a study we did from New York, New York City. We bring our equipment, we made it across different facilities. You can see uh, driving on the road, in a, a transfer at the ground station in the park, subway train, on the ground subway station, urban street. Actually, this shows the PM245 mass concentration. If you are going to advise to the New York City mayor to clean up our transportation system in terms of PM, if you look at this graph, what recommendation would you make? If you say that, okay, we need to clean up these underground stations, and this makes sense here, because why? Because how, 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 how old or how long has our subway system been here with us in New York City? It's more than 100 years old. When a house is old, when you get into half that old house, what do you see? Dust, right? Fugitive dust. However, you can see that fugitive dust, there are kind of, you know, uh, like bigger particles. Now, imagine actually when we are measuring this particle map, actually we, all, we will also measure particle number concentration because particle number concentration captures the smaller particles. Now you can see that in terms of part, particle number, which is the uh, dirtiest place? It's actually urban street side. Because on urban street side, while you are shopping on Fifth Avenue, you are exposed to the fresh, very fine particles coming out from cars and the delivery trucks. So after this is a very a very important slide. You can see that this is, and also I want to use this slide to encourage you. You can see scientific research is really important because imagine that if without this, you know, the mayor could spend the money here, but not necessarily protecting our public health. However, with more scientific discovery, we can better spend our money, right? So of course. How do we measure, how do we model these component numbers? Actually, there is a huge gap in our scientific understanding. This is what I, my group did. Actually, we you know, look at all these different technologies. Actually, we measure and onboard the measurement of this particle number, smaller particles. And then how do we model these things? Actually, we, 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 we monitor, we measure. This is 85% uh, uh, ethanol. And uh, this was natural gas. Uh, and also, this is kind of uh, liquid natural gas. And uh, this is kind of hybrid electric bus. This was a snow plus, and uh, this one is very interesting. This one, we measured these biodiesel powered cars. Actually, uh, in Ithaca, there is a biodiesel company that employees illegal, illegally converted their cars such that they can use this biodiesel. Actually, when these cars pass by, you enjoy it because it smells so good. You can smell, you can smell French fries. <laughs> right, when it by. However, what does that mean for our public health? Right, so kind of we measure all these things and then we move on because this is how we measure, we follow the trucks while we have our equipment on. And then we did all this modeling, uh, kind of trying to find out what transportation factors affect all these particle number emissions such that we can more effectively control these things, right? We did all these models. Um, you know, I'll skip the details of all these models as you can see. We are saying that what kind of technologies even drivers, actually, the same car, drivers are significant factors affecting emissions. Imagine a very aggressive driver versus a smooth driver that can actually make a very uh, big difference in terms of em emissions, right? So, and then we can also model how these 
you know, this kind of particle number concentration can be modeled, can be related to all these transponder factors such that we can quantify all these things. And then how can we account for the, all these, you know, um, nonlinear dynamics, right, in modeling these things. But, and, you know, I'm not going to go into all these details because these are, and also we try to model the particle size distribution, the dependent variable is a curve instead of a scalar or even vector, and we did all this modeling kind of and then measure and the model all these things. These are how the particle size distribution is related to our transporter factor. And then such that we can quantify if we use biofuel, if we use electric vehicle, what that means for our particles. And then now, one thing, even for these actual particles, actually in the air, the particle matter in the air, only about 10 to 20 percent percent are primarily emitted, but 80 to 90 percent are again secondary, like ozone that form in the atmosphere. They are very complicated, so that's why we need to use these kind of kind of chemical transport models to keep track of what is happening there. Now, here I will use this question to test how smart here our NYU students are. So here I show you. You can see that they, here we have a road. Freeway 405, right in Southern California, they have a road here, and this in the daytime, this is daytime wind direction. This is upper wind. If we measure the particle number concentration in the background, kind of upper wind, right, because traffic has not impacted, it, it's very low, and then because of traffic, it goes down like this, right, and then you know it's in California, like a uh, near coastal area, and in the evening time, the wind direction changed, so this becomes upper wind, this becomes a downwind. Right, imagine like you are a graduate student, so you're going to get a job and you find a job, and then, um, like, you're for, for example, um, uh, if you have an office on this side of the road, you go to work every day, and your company pays you quite well, such that you are able to buy a house very soon, and then you know, this is your house. You have a job, you have a house, very good life. Actually, your boss is very good to you, and she has been kind of helping you with all your work. And she even helped you to pick this house, right? But you know, because your you know your company, you have another office that your boss mostly work in this office, and uh, her house uh, is here. So now my question, listen, in these two questions, you and the boss, I do. Can I have your name, please? Daichi. Daichi. Yeah. So here in this picture, you and the boss. Do you want to be you or do you want to be the boss? You want to be you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about this gentleman here? What's your name? Uh, Abina. Abina. The, the boss. You want to be the boss. So now, why do you want to be the boss? Do, do, do the answer so, to so make more money? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but also, the wind is like during the daytime, it's coming towards me. Uh huh. Uh, and the evening is coming towards yeah. the house. So now let's come back to you again. So now do you want to be the boss or do you want to be you? Uh, I try to go again much money. You, you try to go. So you, you, if you want to make more money, you will be the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to, you also want to be the boss. Yeah. That's very good. And why students are brilliant. <laughs> Only two. <laughs> so here, look at this. The daily exposure of this, you know, this student and the boss, it's three times different. Of course, imagine every day you are live, your lifestyle is here and her lifestyle is here. Think about the long term, right? So that's why activity patterns also matter. So speaking of this, I already don't show this to people in New York City, but sorry, I, I forgot to take this uh, slide out. But I'll, I'll tell you anyway. So this what actually was uh, the day when we did our experiment to measure those you know different facilities, those emissions. After we at noon we started in Ithaca. We started in Ithaca. This was the measurement part of normal concern we measured in Ithaca. The same day, the same group of people we, when we get down to New York City. So that, that, I'll be very quick, sorry. We don't want it to be there for too long. <laughs> so what shall we do? What must we do right, for the community and the cities of tomorrow? What, what, what do we need to do? So kind of my answer, that's why so we have to take a system approach. We have to take a system integrative approach such that we account for infrastructure, transport, environment, and health together, especially in the planning and the design and the management, such that we, do, we no longer take this kind of silo approach. 
how you do that. You can see that the event this is city, you know, city DOT, they are doing all this transplant planning. And today, I think at the meeting, we saw a lot of like, a, you know, city DOT people, right, from parking, they're thinking about their work. They're working so hard, but they're in this domain. But what I'm trying to do is that first, I want to translate any decision, any policy into what does that mean for health and for environment. And also we want to have a quantitative assessment. And after we're able to quantitative assess that, and we want to proactively fit this back into the policy decision making such that we can take preventive, proactive measure instead of being just passively. Right? So that's our approach. How do we do that? That's why I'm advocating that we need to break the rules, break the norm for paradigm shifting, right? We need to take, you know, we need to change this paradigm. And as researchers, as students, we need to develop scientific tools to enable the planners to do that kind of things. And then we also need to change our education system, such that in the future, when I give these kind of talks, we have people also from the environment and also from health, right? So, and also, how can we engage all those decision makers, right? So it's really a system approach. So here, how do we integrate all these things together, right? You can see that there is, you know, economic policy, energy policy, and a vehicle standard technology, and also human behavior. All these things, in the middle, we have all this transportation model, you know, Professor Joe Cho did, does a lot of transportation system modeling, and then this kind of mobile emission moves, uh, emissions modeling, and then move on to air quality modeling, and then to health assessment, and in the end, we have all this, and then we can feed this back. So essentially, you can see that we start, for example, there is power system, when we electric power transponder system, land use, transportation, and all these things, models through here, and then come here from for the environment and health, and then feed this back to that, right? So, um, so these are more specific models and tools, like in each step, you know, my group we have been using uh, to do that. So here, some, this is kind of some ongoing, very interesting study. So we are looking at the data. Of course, here I'm, I made a claim that built environment affects our health. But do you believe that? How can I convince you? So here, actually, we are, so is, so we're trying to answer if the built environment or if our transponder is really affecting our health or not, right? So actually, we are looking at this about 13,000 heart failure patients in New York City from 2012 to 2017, right? In addition to consider there are other individual parameters covered, actually, we look at all these built environment you know, parameters, walkability, air pollution, accessibility, traffic exposure, and the crime. Of course, all of these parameters, and uh, you can see that how close do you live to a busy road. And also the busy road, it's heavy tra truck or heavy cars, uh, heavy uh, traffic of cars, and also this is air pollution about New York City. And then here, this is the result. This graph shows the odds ratio, the odds ratio of death, the odds ratio of death in heart failure patients. Of course, this we already accounted for patients' individual data. You can see that all these built environment factors, they have the odds ratio above one. All very significant. And more importantly, you can see that here, definitely built environment affects our physical health. After this is ongoing, uh, you can, of course, these are the policy we're basically show, saying that we definitely need to incorporate this health consideration in our city and the transponder planning. And also, as application of that integrated model framework, we look at the transportation electrification in Houston. Imagine if we, yes. Yes, I will, I will be. And then we look at also, you can see we show how, you know, all these benefits of, we actually each year can see that these are the premature deaths saved by electrification. And this is, the, you know, the manager term. We also look at free transportation using that model. Future revolution, again, we are in pursuit of efficiency. But what is, what does that mean for health? After we develop, you know, this is, right, if the electric transportation, but if our electricity comes from here, right, it's not to solve the problem. That's just, you know, this is a software my group has developed for New York City. This is showing every hour of the day transport emissions. And uh, kind of, we, essentially, we can translate all any you know, transponder policy, infrastructure investment decision into emissions, air quality, and public health implications. 
right? Do this airport modeling, and this is social cost accounting of any infrastructure policy. So essentially, we have really built New York City and across Houston into a test bed that link all the way from infrastructure decision making to health outcomes. So after we can do you know, do this for any city, uh, kind of this is uh, going to be end up very quickly. How do we manage behavior? So kind of very quickly, people are talking about smart cities, but smart cities are example of efficiency. But I'm advocating for smart and healthy cities. How do we do that? Imagine you have a GPS. In addition to telling you the travel time information, what if I also tell you your personal exposure? So this is like two cigarettes. This is like three cigarettes. How would you make your choice? Right? Like we did a simulation using the literature, using willingness to pay uh, you know, from the literature. This is when we only provide people with travel time information for Fresno, California network. And this is what, in addition to travel time, we also provide people with airport information. You can see that actually it can help also reduce congestion. Finally, if you agree with me that infrastructure is so important, and uh, we feel like we need to solve infrastructure, we need to incorporate environment and health dimension into infrastructure, how can we do that? What determines infrastructure? What determines infrastructure? Unfortunately, it leads us to money. Who pays for the infrastructure? Who determines infrastructure? Actually, this is the last topic, public-private partnership. Now, Trump is talking about $2 trillion infrastructure. The Fed government only have five billion, $500 billion. Where do we get that $1.5 trillion? We are talking about private sector. They're talking public-private partnership. It's basically kind of pension fund, Wall Street co companies pay some money, but they will. So essentially, this PPP is essential again. It's a game between the government, the private parties, and the general public. This is <coughs> a game, not like a game you play in Las Vegas. Overnight, you lose $200, you come back, your life goes up. But this is a game over decades. There is renegotiation, and since it's a game, if a game doesn't have equilibrium, is the game going to be successful? No. And actually, PPP, while it's now such a hot topic, but the success rate of PPP has been very low. Actually, this is another research we're looking at. Basically, it's a looking at me mechanism design. How do we have incentive com compatibility to design a game rule, design a contracting rule such that this PPP can be possible? Anyway, you can see that my goal, you can first goal is to advocate for this multidisciplinary systems approach to solve our infrastructure problems. And in here, natural science, social science, technology, and human behavior, we have got to take a transdisciplinary system approach. Look at that. So this is more from education part. And in terms of real practice, I'm advocating for multi-sector collaboration in planning design of our smart and healthy communities. So essentially, mm -hmm. you know, for cities of tomorrow, we have to take this system innovation you can see the system innovation is really the leverage for us to tackle these key uh, challenges so that we can get to the healthy and smart communities of tomorrow. So I believe this is the last slide of my talk. Mm -hmm. I thank you for your time. Hope I keep you awake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a couple minutes for any questions? Uh, thank, you, thank you so much for the interesting talk. Uh, I re really enjoyed the fact that you know your test bed can assess the implications of the, the conservation policies, which certainly is a big deal, especially for uh, as long as we're concerned the environment. I'm just wondering how do you model how do you model the best mode shift that sort of the, like results from in, 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 like implementing those policies? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, very quick, uh, um, yeah, come with this. Actually, underneath, uh, Joe knows it, uh, underneath this, actually, it's the travel demand model. Mm -hmm. The New York City best practice model, travel demand model, yeah. travel demand model that captures, yes. you know, can, travel demand can be run for any scenario that can capture, you know, those. Uh, so basically, the demand is based on the survey data. That's yeah. right. Yes. 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 Of course, you know, the travel demand models <coughs> are essentially simulator are calibrated and validated simulators such that they can be used for future scenarios and policy assessment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you for your presentation. Uh, actually, I have the uh, environment science background, actually. Oh, that's great. Uh, and also, <laughs> I'm doing the simulation test of the transportation uh, system. Uh, 
So from my, uh, I, I totally agree with your argument that we need to have integrate study of this uh, transportation, health, environment study. But from my experience, like these three are totally different tracks of research. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do you make the balance, or how shall we uh, go to the really depth of the research for 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 this three totally different? Go to direction. Yes, go to the depths yeah. that is enough for you to convince people. So, for example, like from a, you know what what you know, am I able to convince you so far? Of course, you can see that. Of course, you can the depths. I don't know if you, know, you have the environmental background. Uh, of course, you know here I, I show the result of all those airport models. But in the in terms of depth, like if. Imagine if we have environmental people here, if they're asking me about, oh, Oliver, how did you model this you know, secondary PM? How do, you order, how do you model this organic second PM versus inorganic second PM? And you should be able to answer those questions, such that you know, your results are on a very good ground. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, how the number of uh, people killed by uh, pollution and the people killed by traffic accidents uh, compare. How do they compare? Yeah, or, yeah. Or how they compare, uh, compare uh, the two numbers? Since it's hard to imagine how the number of uh, people killed by emissions are Yeah, so of course you can see that I just, you know, I, I cited a study from Lancet. That was actually that was published by a group uh, of European researchers back in 2000 uh, in Lancet. Of course, you know I, I remember that they, they did the calculation, but now you know you know I, I don't I didn't go into the depths. But at least you can see. Just think about the rationale. As I mentioned, kind of if a car accident, although we across the nation we have so many car accidents, but one car accident at the most impact, for example say eight people, imagine you have four people in one car, four people in another car when they crash, four people, right? However, air pollution, if, if we have air pollution in this room, see how many people are affected, right? You can see that, and also, it's not only mortality, it's also, we can see that, like the, the, the loss of work days due to sickness because of air pollution, right? You know, no matter what, I think it's kind of, uh, we, uh, you know, those numbers or those uh, those studies, I, I think, kind of really gives us uh, rings the bell to us, such that I think we should also pay attention to those aspects which we did not before. Yeah. yeah uh, and the second question is about your hypothesis. Uh, so, can your study show the causal relationship between annual X and? Yeah. Uh -huh. or just the correlation? So actually you can see that, um, oh, not here, uh, where, I, I show, I show that those heart failure, uh, and anyway, I show the heart failure, right? That heart failure, that's used on the historical data. Uh, you know, we, we already accounted for all the individual covariates. After we even account for those individual covariates and those building environment factors are still significant, right? But still, I would say that it's a very strong association. But for you to prove causality, you should have like kind of a time series and look at delta and correlate the delta. We did not, we don't have that kind of you know health data uh, to do. However, I do want to assure that since we have those patient. Uh, that over five years, actually, we have another paper looking at how the heart, you know, heart disease, heart failure disease progress. Whether the progression of the heart failure disease is associated with air pollution and traffic. You know, if we, I think we already have those results. You know, that result is showing at least gives us a better support of a causality. But still, I don't want to claim the causality because you know it's uh, from a rigorous point of view. Um, the data doesn't support like a causality study yet. Yeah. Yes. Last one, and then if anyone wants to follow up with Professor Gao, you can do that. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so in your presentation, you alluded to the fact that the cities are more polluted than 
non urban areas, which is true, but is this is there also like a uh, population consideration like controlling for like urban data emission, for example? Because cities are usually much more populated. Like if you compare like in New York City to a uh, suburban area, mm -hmm. less people drive personal cars, like a lot of people take transit here. So is there also that controlling for the amount of people who live in this area? So are you talking about like kind of per capita? Yeah, per, per capita. So actually, you know, New York City, given the size, actually New York City, you know, with its nice transit system <coughs> per capita, actually New York City is relatively low, like even compared to other cities. But unfortunately, because you know uh, the population, the demand is so high, such that even per capita is low, but the end, the end, the end result is very high. The end result pollution is very high. And when the, the result pollution is high, and you have so much population density, the impact is also high. That's why New York City is ranked number one in terms of diesel risks in this country. So that's even though per capita we're doing quite well. But we still need to do more. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll close here. So if you have question, I'll be very happy to answer. But otherwise, please feel free to uh, you know uh, <laughs> to follow your own schedule. Thank you.